Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar, Sustainable Energy for Essentially Humanitarian Services. This webinar is a joint collaboration between ICRC, Energypedia, and UNITA. It is a part of a series of webinar on humanitarian energy nexus. Therefore, we invite you to check out our previous webinar where we provided, where we did a mapping of all stakeholders who are active in the humanitarian energy spaces, and also stay tuned for all our upcoming webinars. In a follow-up email that we will send after the webinar, we will include a link to our previous webinar as well as a link to our to the recording of this webinar. And now, before we begin the webinar, I wanted to uh, say a few house rules. So uh, this is, by the way, Ranisha. I'm moderating this webinar along with my colleague Lisa uh, Lisa Feldman from Energypedia. And the house rules are on the right side of your screen. You'll see a chat box. There you have the option called questions. Please type in your questions during the webinar and then send them to us. We will collect all your questions and then send it to the respective speaker during the Q&A session. And please, when you are sending us your questions, please type in for whom it is addressed. For example, speaker one, speaker two, and so on. Now let's begin with the webinar. So we want to kickstart the webinar by knowing a little bit more about you, the audience. So now a poll question will pop up in your screen. And now, as you can see on your screen, there is a pop-up question. So please tell us where are you tuning in today from? Are you tuning in from Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, or some other regions? So I can see um, people, um, so our attendees are typing in their response. So I'll leave it for a few more seconds for the response to come in. So a bit more seconds, a few more seconds, uh, because I see a lot more uh, responses coming in. And now I'll close the web, uh, sorry, the poll and display the results. So today we have a lot of people tuning in from Europe, a bit from Africa and also from uh, Asia, Latin America and other countries. So welcome to all of you one more time. And now I'll have a second question popping up on your screen. So please tell us in which sector do you work? Are you working in energy related organization, humanitarian organization, energy companies or research institute? So this information will help us to fine tune our other upcoming webinars. Um, and I'll also leave the poll for a few more seconds. a bit more seconds because a lot of people are typing in their responses um, and now I'll close the poll and display the results so we have a lot of attendees who are working in the humanitarian sector followed by energy related organization energy companies and research institutions so I hope this webinar will be interesting to all of you so now I'll go back to sharing my screen So after that brief poll, I just wanted to quickly say the agenda for today. So today, as part of this webinar, we'll have three presentations. The first two presentations will focus on case studies from private companies, a Schneider Electric, Electric, followed by Grunfos. And then we'll have a final presentation about solar pumping from ICRC um, Lebanon. So now I want to kickstart the webinar with our first thematic presentation. And for that, I would like to invite Oliver Jacquet, who is the Global Account Manager of um, Refugees, Emergency and War for Schneider Electric. And Oliver has many years of experience working in the um, energy sector within a Schneider Electric. And today he's going to talk about different approaches of, uh, sorry, approaches of Schneider Electric um, within the energy sector. So, Oliver, the floor is yours. I'm going to quickly unmute you now.
So you are now unmuted and I will quickly change the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning uh, or good afternoon to, to all of you. So I'm going to quickly maybe introduce uh, the context at Schneider Electric and then we go in uh, some example how private sector and humanitarian organizations could collaborate. So on the next slide, you will see a uh, short a brief of uh, Schneider Electric Company. So as you can see on this slide, we have a worldwide presence. Uh, we are uh, investing a very significant part of our activity in R&D, representing roughly 5% of our annual turnover. And uh, basically what you should know about Schneider is that we are uh, worldwide specialists of energy efficiency and energy management uh, overall. Next slide. So since about uh, 20 years ago, we started to get involved in projects uh, which are more more uh, humanitarian than what we regularly do in terms of business. And we initially started uh, using our own Schneider Electric Foundation to finance and donate um, equipment so as to, to conduct projects in uh, uh, different countries. And we realized that uh, even though we are a large group, uh, what we were doing was like a drop in the ocean. And we decided to change our mindset at that time, it was six, seven years ago, and started uh, with a new approach, which is to build up a social business, meaning that it's not like our regular business where we try to make profit like any other private company. In this one, we just aim at uh, developing an activity with a, a just enough kind of margin to pay for our own cost, but not generate any profit. Okay, so that's where, uh, I'm involving uh, all my energy with my team to try to develop this. So globally, uh, we are talking here about 1 billion people in the world who do not have access to electricity at all. And we estimate 3 billion who have access to electricity but with, with very poor uh, access. For example, take uh, people that have a, a lighting point being a candle or a kerosene lamp. These are dangerous means because uh, they can harm their health in, in, in uh, uh, houses that are not well ventilated. There is a smoke that is affecting their health, uh, resulting also in environment uh, problems like deforestation. And basically, uh, they are also spending a lot of their uh, yearly income to buy those candles, kerosene lamps, and so on. So there are ways uh, that we, tr we are trying to find, developing a dedicated offer that we can provide to those people a much safer, more durable and sustainable way of getting access to electricity. And we took that mission within my, uh, my department, uh, which is how to provide access to electricity for everyone. Basically, we take as a granted that access to electricity is the start of development, whether it's social, economical development, for example, uh, access to electricity can trigger uh, access to water, access to health, access to security, access to, develop, to uh, development in terms of economy, because you can start to run businesses like uh, shops, haircutting, uh, boutiques, etc. Next slide. Okay, so basically we have developed our activity in three big pillars and I'm going to talk mainly on the first one on the left. So I'll start with the, on the right. Our most ancient activity is to train electricians in rural areas. Uh, we started this activity 15 years ago. We're doing this in the form of a, a donation, meaning we, people are not paying to benefit from our uh, general training uh, topics on electricity and renewables. Uh, the only thing that we sell are the didactical benches. Uh, so since 15 years ago, we've trained 200,000 electricians in rural areas, mainly in Asia uh, and Africa. Uh, 100 schools in India, namely, and uh, uh, all over Africa, 100 schools. And basically, we want to continue this 
this effort and reach a, a million electricians trained uh, by uh, 2025. Basically, the way we do the training is that we use volunteers, which are either retiree people or volunteers who take over their vacation time to go to Africa, train uh, some trainers who could then train the students. The second pillar is investment. We are investing in startup companies that have a, are bringing a difference in terms of technology uh, that can help people bring access to electricity. And the pillar I'm going to focus on now is offer on business model. Uh, so if you go two slides uh, down, you will see that we have developed over the years, past six, seven years, a range of products that uh, really can respond to the, the needs of the poorest population in, in countries where electrification rate is poor. So if you go two slides down, Lisa. Yeah, my, my uh, screen is fixed, so I hope you can see uh, this range of offers. Yes, that's it. Uh, which is ranging from uh, individual uh, product solar lanterns uh, up to um, complete plug and play microgrid systems, going through solar home systems, solar street lights, solar water pumping, and so on. And basically, we're trying to develop this solution at affordable price with high quality products. Uh, the main challenge for a private company like us is that. We are very, let's say, experienced and mature in terms of industry, developing products, uh, robustness of products. We are very used to working in urban and peri-urban areas for the doing business. And it's a challenge for us to do business in rural areas. So we're trying to find partners, uh, channels, business models that will enable to us to do this. And NGOs, United Nations affiliates, is really a, a great means so far we've developed several partnerships which are very successful uh, along this line of products. Next slide. Okay, so this is an example I like maybe to, to focus on uh, for you to understand how this partnership could uh, uh, take form. Uh, so this is a, a containerized microgrid that we have developed, uh, co-developed by the way, about a year and a half ago with uh, uh, Geneva staff of UNHCR. Um, and basically, UNHCR was thinking on how they could possibly uh, complement or replace uh, diesel generators that are mainly feeding their life uh, base uh, nearby the refugee camps, but also in the future to feed uh, uh, key uh, points of the refugee camps, like uh, churches, uh, schools, etc. And basically, we came up with this offer. So you have a plug and play solution. You can deploy the panels that are on wheels. There is a reason for that is that UNHCR is operating on lands that they don't own. So for insurance reasons, they need to not tie those PVs to the ground. Okay? But we have solution with uh, PVs that can be tied. And the advantage of this container is that you can take it off the site or on another site. It's mobile, just like a gen uh, diesel genset. And it's also plug and play, meaning you just bring the container by truck or by helicopter for this 10 feet container any helicopter can can bring into site and you can operate and we call this offer rely emergency because that's obviously well suited for uh, emergency response especially for uh, uh, natural disasters like hurricanes etc uh, what's also interesting is that with UNHCR we worked also with some startups because Schneider we had uh, mostly the electronic and software uh, components inside this offer that we could uh, propose, but we had to partner with a startup for the, the structure that is holding the solar uh, photovoltaic panels, as well as a, a Swiss manufacturer of batteries, which is very suited for tropical climate since it, uh, it resists to very, very high temperatures without needing for uh, air conditioning inside the container. And we've made this a standard offer thanks to this work with UN. Uh, it's now industrialized in a factory we have in Kenya. Uh, we're serving mainly Africa market. Uh, and, uh, and this is for us a success story where we can both meet the needs of a humanitarian uh, organization and also develop the business uh, as a private uh, company. Uh, so that's uh, what I wanted to share with, uh, with you today. Uh, of course, I remain available should you have further questions even after 
uh, this seminar. Uh, I'm sure Lisa or the organizers would be happy to share my, uh, my contact. I also invite you, maybe you see that in the next slide, we are having a lot of communication activities around this, this access to energy uh, business. Uh, we are communicating mainly on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And as you can see, if we speak of Africa, which is embedding 60% uh, of the people not having access to electricity, we have a, a really good presence. So we have offices which are local and could talk directly to your operations should you have uh, antennas in, uh, in those countries that you see on the, on the screen. Next slide. I think next slide is a picture of our factory that I mentioned before uh, in Nairobi in Kenya, uh, where we are. Uh, we have recently industrialized the microgrid containerized uh, uh, offer. So this is another picture of the factory. Okay, so basically this is uh, where we where we stand and we hope that we can continue to develop uh, partnerships with uh, NGOs, humanitarian sector. And uh, should you have any question or needs, we are, we are happy to respond. Thank you, Olivia. I think I skipped through some of your slides, so sorry about that. No problem, um, no problem. And I'll just display this screen, which has your contact information uh, in case anybody is interested. I think that's the most important slide. Yes, yes, with pleasure. And I hope the sound was good because I'm currently uh, connected from Kinshasa in Congo. And sometimes we have issue with the Wi-Fi here. No problem. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us such valuable insight into um, services that could be deployed into the humanitarian settings. And we will come back to you with questions towards the end. Um, but now I would like to move on to the second presentation for today. So I'll quickly mute you back. Okay. So um, now I will quickly want to talk about the second presentation for today. Um, and for our second presentation, I would like to invite Morten Rees and Geraldine from Greenforce Holdings. Morten is the group director for the water utility, sorry, water utility program within Greenforce. And he has more than 25 years of experience. But Geraldine Shri Yi Lin is the global pro product manager within Grunforce, and she also has more than 10 years of experience within the Grunforce program, uh, sorry, organization. And today, together, they are going to talk about Grunforce activities. And I'm now going to unmute both of you. So, Martin, you are now unmuted, and Geraldine, I'll also unmute you now. And now, please go ahead with the presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, together with my dear colleague, Geraldine. Uh, as stated here on this uh, first slide, uh, we'd like to, to talk a bit about sustainable solutions and, and actually in this, um, in this way, addressing both water and energy aspects of it. Briefly about uh, Grundfos, uh, the company was founded more than, than 70 years ago by Mr. Paul Du Jensen. At that time, he was thinking, how can I support the local farmers with water in an, in, an efficient, uh, in an efficient way? And he invented a pump solution for this specific purpose, subtraction, subtraction of groundwater. And basically, that's where the name come for us, come from. Foss is a water source and ground is within the, the ground we, we pursue it. During the last decades, pump uh, and pump solution has been developed for various applications optimized towards uh, its uh, uh, specific purposes, whether it's for water supply, whether it's for wastewater or something totally different. Today, we are producing uh, around 17 uh, million pump units a year. And besides that, as you, as you will see also some examples here today, we likewise provide solutions beyond the pump, so to speak. We are around 19,000 uh, colleagues around the world. Please uh, take the next slide. So, next slide, please. Yes. 
So Grundfos has always had a strong engagement in the sustainability or in the sustainable agenda or in the latter years defined in a UN context as the sustainable development goals. So why are we in, in Grundfos doing this and why is this important for us? Well, actually, it started from the very first day, the founder growing up in, in under poor circumstances, always with an innovative mindset, thinking, can we do better and how can we do this? And this thinking also uh, was uh, continued by his son, Nils, uh, when and he took over. So just some, some brief quotes from uh, the two uh, generations here. Um, you could say, this is actually a part of our DNA. And basically it's an incremental part of the very purpose of Grundfos. And our purpose is not just a bold statement, but it's the way the owner of Grundfos, the Paul Du Jensen Foundation is taking up the ownership role. And yes, Grundfos is making money, but as stated here, this is not an, an end goal, but an enabler to pursue this purpose. Um, just on a more detailed level on how we contribute both internally as well as externally to sustainability, please uh, look at our website, grundfos.com, for the latest sustainability report. Please take the next slide. Now, as you saw in the Grundfos purpose, water plays a central role for us. Um, pumps provides and removes water. Accordingly, we can play a role when there's too much water, flooding, as well as too little water and scarcity. So looking at the sustainability, sustainable development goals, this is goal number six. And it's about securing safe water as well as handling the wastewater. And as we see from these figures from the UN, there's a lot to do on a global scale. As previously mentioned, we also go beyond the pump and in example making systems, e, an example for, for safe water treatment, where uh, sorry, the pumps is of course an, an important part, but it's not all of it. So here we want to contribute and make a difference. Please take the next slide. So in the title, um, of the presentation, we mentioned the so-called water nexus. And, and one of the dimensions of this so-called nexus is the importance of energy when handling water as well as wastewater. On the left side here, uh, you see um, a small quote from a, the, from a UN uh, report. It states that electricity costs can be up to 40% of the total operating cost for when, when handling uh, water and wastewater. And looking at it, uh, at it in an aggregated perspective, that again can be up to 40% of the municipality's energy bill. And as you will see here, um, this, is, this is not only in, in, in specific countries, practically all over the world. The latter one uh, at the right was uh, from the US Congressional Research Service. So basically we see it all around the world. Energy efficiency is key to reduce cost, of course, that's important, uh, but likewise, it's about uh, reducing CO2 emissions uh, from the related energy production, if it's not uh, re renewable. Uh, please take the next slide. As stated in uh, the latter part, uh, the, the, the CRS um, report, uh, you saw also that up to 80% of the energy usage is related to water, uh, sorry, for pumping water. And that means, of course, it makes perfectly sense to look at energy efficiency related to, to, to pumps. And we have done that for all the years uh, been in business. And just here, some of the reflections when we go out in the, in the field and see how much is usually taking up, looking at a total, um, a total life cycle cost perspective when buying a pump, up to 85% of the, the cost is, of the life cycle cost is around energy. It's only 5%, that's the, the actual initial cost. So basically it makes sense to look at energy efficiency when buying pumps um, in the long run, it pays off. Please take the next slide. Well, as an example on energy efficiency within our pumps, we have during the, uh, during the years reduced the energy consumption uh, in one of our pump uh, examples is the small circulator pumps, 
that takes up around or took up around 60 watts and it could be compared to a traditional light bulb. Today, after our development, we are around two or four watts, meaning you could actually make some kind of analogy towards moving from a traditional light bulb to a LED lamp. So basically, we definitely do a lot within um, the product itself, but how can we continue here? And what we're doing here is of course to, to continue our optimization inside the pump, but basically we also need to look around how can we optimize on a system level. And this is an example I put up here. Um, this is when, when operating a pump station in a city area. Here often the pressure in the network is too high. And that means you're using too much energy. And at the same time, actually, when having a too high pressure, it means too much water is lost during, due to leaks in the pipes. So basically, by introducing sensored, sensors and advanced controls in our pumping station, we can reduce both. And typically, this is an additional 20 to 30 percent on top of, of, of general um, energy, energy efficiency aspects. Now, looking at energy usage related to water, the next level is, of course, to introduce renewable as a direct energy source for the systems. We did that, we introduced that long time ago, and here I would like to hand over to my colleague, Geraldine. Geraldine, please. Hello. So thank you very much. And, uh, would you please move to the next slide? I hope my voice is clear. And um, so, yeah, so as you can see, I have joined Greenforce for 10 years, but uh, but uh, actually Greenforce has been engaged in SDG 6 uh, a lot earlier than I have joined Greenforce. It actually our journey of, of uh, contributing to SDG 6 since started since 1980s and uh, and that is back to the time when solar panel is, is really really expensive and and we are almost the only one offering a uh, a solar pumping solution and and as modern has talked about that um that actually our founder has uh, start with thinking that in many of the places where people don't have electricity and they also actually don't have uh, water access and all of the water access is really really difficult they have they involve hand pump and walking a long distance and therefore we started to develop actually the first um, solar pumping um, solutions and that is back to the time where where it is not at all considered to be a, uh, a good business as you can say and uh, it's not even something that we have intended to turn it into a a, a business we are we are hoping that with the technology and the competence that we own that we can build a solution that is really helping people to get access to king, uh, drinking water and as you can see on the timeline uh, over the last few decades we have evolved a lot and we have uh, expand our our solution a lot so and um, so we also go into an approach that is not just um, providing uh, water access to king drinking water but we also um, getting a lot into more a holistic approach on uh, addressing also the water scarcity problem and safe water and water purification situations and uh, so we have um, we have also evolved to learn a lot from from our experience from 1980s up to year 2000 with all our project with different um, aid organizations and UN organizations and, and many different projects and ourselves as Greenforce we also make a lot of uh, donation through our foundation and we also have an employee project where we make our own donation and giving quite a lot of system and in the process we actually also have experienced a very steep learning curve of like and our partner have mentioned and slider have mentioned it is very different we are very experienced on on put, on offering a solution that is in a uh, in in a city environment where where it's easy to get access to a plumber and and to get to the tools and uh, when we start the journey we figure out it is a very different location that we're going into and uh, and so we also actually evolved to develop one of the you can say almost the most complicated pump uh, that we have in Green Force in, in uh, 2002, in order to offer a very simple solutions in uh, in a remote village. So, so many people think are ah, a very high technology, 
to be used in a very remote location must be wrong. And actually, it's not the way like that. It is actually in order to make the solution very simple to the end user. And that's why the technology behind it is actually much more complicated. It's because we are trying to make it almost foolproof and bulletproof as, as much as we can. And uh, ever since our very, very unique solution launched in um, 2002 called SQFX, in the, in the, in the last um, in the last 20 years, then uh, we also joining the the global trend of that the solar panel price has dropped so much, and uh, and we also actually the portal has now become a not just a um, humanitarian solutions and providing clean drinking water in remote location. We also support a lot in the in SDG 13 and and having fight the climate change and reduce energy consumption in other applications. With SQFX, in at least in only in the last decade, we have shifted more than 300,000. SQ facts and uh, and we can count it is millions of people that we have provided king drinking water and uh, and at least half of them is actually shipping into a um, relatively difficult environment so it means that it's not easy to uh, to access to tools and to, to local competence and that we also has involved into a lot of training uh, with uh, different of our partners and we in the process of these 300,000 pumps we didn't install every single one ourselves we in the process we have a lot of lots of partners and and they involve many many different NGOs and mo many local small business and that we also provide a lot of training and helping them to to be up to speed. I would say, in terms of the solar pumping area, in uh, at least uh, for example in in Sub-Saharan Africa, I would say the competence level has has been really grown a lot in the last uh, ten years. And next slide, please. And just a simple overview of what kind of solution that we are talking about that we have. Um, we we have a, uh, a you can say water intake solutions that can take uh, surface water or groundwater. So we have a submersible pump and a surface pump that are primarily running on solar. And one thing I would like to highlight is that is all the green for solar solution that we offer, they are always. ACDC compatible, and what does that mean? It means that where well, we also take care of to the situation where the sun is not shining, where you really need to use a backup source, and in many cases it could be a very complicated option to have. You need to have an extra boxes, and you have you need to have extra connections, and could sometimes could be difficult to handle if you don't have electricians around. And and all the solar products that we offer from Greenforce, we always have that in our mind to make sure that. The product itself can using any backup power so, uh, power source that you have to have to use. So in the case where the solar panel is um, is broken or got stolen or so anything happened, even just just the sun is not shining, and you were always able to using the backup power source. And we have a very simple solution where we build a typical off-grid pumping system into one pump level. So the pump that you're looking at called SQFX and CRFX, they actually owns a features and competence, just like a, a system level solution where you will normally find, including auto protection and dry run detections. So it has uh, everything built in at the pump level. So we are not just stopping at the water intake. We also consider now, apart from water intake, what about water safety? Do they have a safe king drinking water? So we also have a solar powered water purification um, system that is called AQ Pure that we can purify to make sure that uh, the water level is clean enough for, for drinking purpose. And then last but not least is how about water scarcity? And uh, because solar pumping sometimes could also be the evil in the process because yeah, used to when we're using hand pump, then people would stop pumping when they don't need the water. But now when it's solar pumping, then it's, there's no sweat then so they can just pump. And uh, so how do we make sure that um, the water scarcity problem is also being considered. So that's why we also have a product called AQTAP, where we, we would take into account that this, we have to promote responsible water use. And so that people understand it is a small water kiosk, like an ATM, where you buy a, a jewelry can of water at a very, very low price. And the price is always adjusted according to the income of the local community. So the purpose of that is not to make a profit out of selling water. The purpose of that is just so that we make sure that people understand that water actually comes at a cost and uh, and so that we are promoting a more responsible use of uh, of water and at the same time by 
having a, a finance system built in in a product, it also means that we actually promote some kind of a lo local entrepreneurship. So, uh, so there will be people able to run this water kiosk and there will be um, technical competence have to build in order to maintain such a system. So, so they also start to actually running some small business in the community. So this is how we see, and this is also the solution that we offer from Gunfor. So from water intake into actually the glass of the end user who is drinking it. Uh, last uh, slide, please. And so this is the journey up to today, what we are doing. This is something that's already in the market. Then you can say, what is your ambitions toward uh, 2030? Uh, from Greenforce, we have a lot of ambitions ourselves into what we use water and how responsible we can be. And but one of the things that more external is we want to contribute and providing safely managed drinking water to 300 million people in need by 2030. And how are we going to do that? And uh, I cannot really discuss more uh, to you now, but, but we have a few keywords uh, we have in mind, and basically is also the foundations of the pillar that we're building on on the solution up to 2030 in order to achieve this goal, and that is it has to be sustainable. It is not just the the power that is sustainable. So that's of course they have to be renewable. It has to be clean energy, but it's also the water source has to be sustainable. And how do we make sure they are sustainable? It has to be resilient. We have to able to help uh, village and countries to be resilient. And then it has to be connected. They have to be able to be controlled. They have to be smart and they has to be attractive where people would able would like to use the system not just when this in crisis, but also after the crisis has passed and the, the people will feel safe and feel attracted to stay in the same pace. So that's all I have for today. And I look forward to hearing some questions from you and uh, we'll be happy to uh, to give. I try not to put too many technical contents, but if any of you interest in a lot of a lot more technical contents on the product, that I'll be super happy to uh, to let you know or to get in touch with any of you. Thank you to both of you for a lovely presentation and there have been some questions coming in but as promised we'll collect all the questions and then uh, give them to you towards the end of the webinar uh, during the question and answer session. So now I will then mute both of you back. And as you can already see on my screen it's time for another poll. So now on your screen, you should see a third poll question popping in. So if you could tell us how well do you know about solar pumping? So if you are a beginner, you are an expert, or you have no idea about at all, this would be very interesting to us because the next presentation will focus on solar pumping. So we have some responses coming in. I'm going to leave the poll for a few more seconds to collect the responses. And now I'll close the poll and display the results. So as you can see on the screen, we have a lot of attendees who are in the intermediate, some are at beginners and some are expert. So we really hope that after this next case studies and with also from our previous presentations, you have now some knowledge about solar pumping and for the experts in the audience, um, this presentation will be more interesting to, uh, will be interesting to you. So now I'll go back to sharing my presentation. And now I would like to invite the third speaker uh, for today. His name is Christian Lenz. He's working as Deputy Water and Habitat Coordinator as ICRC Lebanon. And he has many years of experience as engineer and working in different projects. And today Christian is going to present his experience of um, implementing solar pump in a, re, um, in a refugee or humanitarian setting in Arsa, Lebanon. So Christian, I'm going to now unmute you so that we can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to the case study on solarization of pumping stations in Arsa, Lebanon. I work indeed for the International Committee of the Red Cross, in short, the ICRC, which is a space organization based in Geneva, and we are responding to humanitarian crises in settings of conflict and other situations of violence worldwide since more than 150 years. 
in Lebanon. The ICRC has been working since 1948 and established a permanent delegation with its own office in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, in 1967. I work for the Water and Habitat Unit of the ICRC, which is the engineering department of this organization. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So in this case study, I will present to you how we used solar energy to successfully increase the water production in the remote town of Arsal in uh, Lebanon. The presentation is uh, one slide back, please. It's loading very slowly. <laughs> the, presentation is structured in a short introduction on the context here in Lebanon in general and then more specifically on Arsal. Um, uh, I will give you a short explanation of ICRC's systemic support approach, a brief overview of the water system in Arsal city and an explanation on the main problematic we faced in terms of electricity, and then an overview on the implemented solar project, talking briefly about our key design considerations and the final system configuration. We then conclude and uh, I'm happy to take questions. So we will talk about water supply, but we have to keep in mind that the availability of electricity is really the limitation to basically all services, including water. Next slide, please. Why is the ICRC working in Lebanon and why in Arsal? Lebanon, already weakened by 15 years of civil war from 1975 to 1999, uh, 1990, sorry, and then the war with Israel in 2006 suffered additional pressure on its resources and services since the onset of the Syrian crisis on about 4.2 million Lebanese living here and additional 1.5 million Syrian refugees arrived fleeing the conflict and violence in their home country. Arsal is a town located in the Beka highlands close to the Syrian border. In Arsal, 42,000 mostly Sunni Lebanese traditionally with cultural and economic ties to Syria welcomed about 100,000 Syrian refugees. Today, about 40,000 refugees remain in informal tented settlements. These are the red triangles you can see on the map all around the city of Arsal. And this, the initially warm welcoming cooled down soon after because it also meant much more difficult living conditions for the host communities. The humanitarian situation worsened in the summer 2014 after an attempt of the Lebanese armed forces to control the area. Back then, the ICRC was one of the very few humanitarian organizations that was actually capable of working in Arsal. And in response to a disastrous humanitarian crisis, we managed to set up a large humanitarian assistance program providing shelter assistance, we worked with water systems, we provided healthcare services, and we ran livelihood assistance programs. As an emergency response, we, the engineering department, repaired ourselves water pumping stations several times, and we supplied fuel to run backup generators. The situation lasted for no less than three years until summer 2017, when the Lebanese armed forces managed to control the situation. With the improved stability and security, we were also able to adapt our support from being mostly reactive to proactive. That means we started working on a systemic level rather than as an emergency response. Next slide, please. I would like to briefly explain what I mean when I talk about systemic support. Um, systemic support means to consider systems as a whole. It is very important to understand that uh, it requires a good understanding of the system and that you have to think in a long term way. So we think in three categories. One is the infrastructure. Then we have the financial and human resources. And finally, we have a management model. And these three categories are all interdependent and equally important for the system to function. 
let's consider a water system in uh, these three categories. So infrastructure, we need for the water system to run functional hardware. For example, a submersible pump, an electric control board or solar panels. But then we need also financial and human resources. We need skilled operators. We need financial means to pay for salaries and to pay for maintenance. And finally, we need a management model. We need a management model to allow us organizing tasks and uh, to link, for example, consumers or complaint management or billing to the infrastructure where we do read water meters or where we perform maintenance. So the systemic support stands for the reconciliation of all these three fields in a comprehensive way to ensure a functional service provision balanced between these three fields. And I would like to refer at this point to a publication from 2015 done by the engineering unit of the ICRC that is called Urban Services During Protracted Armed Conflict. And if you're interested, I warmly invite you to, to read uh, this reference. But then the objective is not only to help uh, the system provide its service better in terms of quality and quantity, but also to make it more resilient to resisting possible future shocks to the system. Shocks can be situations of armed conflict, effects of the climate crisis or economic difficulties. In order to achieve that, we work closely with the responsible authorities, both on ministry and on field level. And is really thank to this good cooperation that we have in Lebanon that we are in a position to positively contribute to improve the situation of the Lebanese resident population and Syrian refugees alike. Next slide, please. The infrastructure and public services in Lebanon remain highly deficient and electricity being the cornerstone of all public services such as water supply or healthcare is the bottleneck. The WEF Global Competitiveness Report from 2014 and 15 ranked Lebanon on uh, rank 143 out of 144 in terms of quality of the electrical supply. Safe water supply remains not guaranteed therefore and the Ministry of Energy and Water is very well aware of this. And in the scope of the SED conference, uh, electricity and water are high on the agenda with a total investment volume of about 8.8 .8 billion US dollars. Arsal, that you, by the way, can see in the picture, is a remote rural town at about 1,550 meters above sea level. And it has been historically underserved by public services. Power is therefore no exception, and Arsal is served only by a very weak and unstable medium voltage uh, power line coming from the lowlands. On a national level, the Ministry of Energy and Water is responsible for water services throughout the whole of Lebanon. In the Beka, this is the valley in the northeast, the ministry mandated the Beka water establishment as the entity in charge of water. In the past, Beka water establishment has been unable to guarantee a presence in Arsal, and this mainly because of the lack of resources. In the absence of uh, national and regional authorities, a local water committee within Arsal municipality does its best to manage the water systems and keep them running, however, with largely unqualified personnel. Next slide, please. In Arsal, we try to work with all relevant authorities, bringing them closer together as various projects move forward. The water system has initially been designed to serve uh, 32,000 inhabitants, but today it reaches, uh, it supplies only water to 6,700 people. In our systemic approach, we planned over five years proposing to move forward step by step, aiming at the final objective. And this is presented in the table where you can see in uh, blue and uh, our projects that are work mainly uh, in the sphere of infrastructure where we try to increase water production. So solarization of boreholes, etc. In red, you can see um, mainly activities that target the management model. So in the first step, we try to monitor and understand the system, both from an overall, but also from an end user point of view. 
And finally, in green, we have uh, activities in the sphere of management model and human and financial uh, resources, where we support relevant authorities in managing their water systems better. But today we are going to talk mainly about the solarization project. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the main elements of the public water system in Arsal are the following. We have a water production by four wells with a total yield of about 40 liters per second. So we produce around 1000 cubic meters per day. This water is then stored in four reservoirs that uh, have a capacity of 6000 cubic meters. And finally, from the tanks, the water is distributed through a network connecting about 11,200 uh, people or around 2,000 households. Now, this is only 35% of all uh, residents uh, in Arsal. Of course, the, the network has losses and we estimate them to be between 25 to 50% depending on the location. But if we now assume losses of 25%, and we use the national guideline for a good service level of 120 liters per person and day, the produced water is enough for about 9,000 individuals, which is only 25% of the host community. So as a result, residents in Arsal have to resort to very expensive coping mechanisms such as water trucking or small local private networks. But these solutions, they are about three times more expensive than the public uh, water supply would actually cost. On the other hand, Syrian refugees are relatively well served through water trucking by international humanitarian actors. This leads to tensions as the host community feels overlooked. We can support these figures uh, through a survey that we conducted initially to better understand the situation. And the results of this survey are visualized in the map as green dots, which uh, indicate households that are receiving water, and red dots, which are interviewed households but not receiving water. Today, thanks to improvements, the medium voltage power line that supplies electricity from the BK up to Arsal is uh, providing electricity for about 12 hours a day. However, the electricity remains the main restriction to increase water production and availability is limited and quality is not always sufficient. Several times pumps were burned due to power quality issues. To improve the situation, we designed and implemented two solar systems. The two systems are very similar in terms of specifications and therefore I will focus in the rest of my presentation only on one of them. Next slide, please. When we talk now about uh, the solar systems, I present you quickly the key design considerations. So one was to integrate the, ex uh, the existing infrastructure. The solar system had to be designed to accommodate that, for example, to run the existing AC pumps. The same pump also runs regularly on the medium voltage power line or on a backup generator. And the idea was to solarize them and install inverters. This had implications on sizing and the choice of electrical equipment. We optimized the location. The difficult terrain required us to choose the initial location in order to avoid some very hard rock uh, structures. And as an additional complication, land ownership in Arsal is not strongly documented. During both planning and implementation phase, several changes had to be accommodated as private entities claimed the supposedly public land. Taking into consideration irradiation data for summer and winter, we optimize the inclination. I will come back on this. Finally, the whole system is optimized for net cash saving after 10 years. While a bigger system size would allow us to operate for a longer time per day, it also means increased system cost. The system size was defined by optimizing the net cash saving after 10 years. This took also into consideration the cost of electricity from the grid and the operating cost of the backup generators in the time slots where the solar system is not the primary source of power. Finally, we had to take uh, some safety issues into consideration because there is a nearby quarry where stone cutting is performed and there is a risk of falling stones 
and in winter lightning uh, poses an important uh, risk to the installation so it was necessary to install a fence to resist the stones and to have lightning protection next slide please now i present you the final system configuration the implemented uh, pv system integrates existing infrastructure again so the submersible AC pump can be powered by the solar system or alternatively by the grid or a backup generator. Therefore, it was required to keep the old control panel in place. And the new control panel, however, is the master that allows to choose the power source automatically or manually. 480 panels are arranged in six uh, strings, sorry, six strings with 16 modules each, and they produce a total power of 153.6 kilowatt. Each module is made up of five solar panels of 320 watt. The setup presented in the schematic uh, does not really reflect the physical setup because the design had to be adapted. Uh, as you can see on the left, we have this hard rock formation and on the right, you see this private land that was claimed. The system is optimized at an inclination of the panels of 15 degrees. In January, for example, this allows us a production of around uh, 9,000 kilowatt hours compared with 10,000 kilowatt hours that would be possible at an inclination of 30 degrees. However, in order to avoid shading, a larger and therefore more expensive structure would be required. It was also taken into consideration that water consumption is higher in summer than in winter, and therefore we considered 50 degrees uh, appropriate. It allows the pumps to run for 5.21 hours per day on average. It is worth mentioning that we installed a small water network that allows the operators to clean the panels from dust without scratching the PV panels, which then would affect their performance. Finally, there is a data acquisition system that records basic operating data of the pumping station, so the water part and the PV installation, the solar part. Among the collected data, we have, for example, for the PV system, the ambient temperature, module temperature, solar irradiation, and of course, electrical data. And on the pumping system, we can read operating hours, electrical data, such as voltages and currents, or information on the water production. It would also be interesting to even go one step further and implement uh, automation that allows the system to be remotely controlled. In terms of resilience, it would be a huge added value if the pumping station could be operated even if access is not possible due to, for example, security reasons. The system is quite significantly oversized in comparison with the pump. So 153.6 kilowatt solar versus 93 kilowatt of the pump. We did so in order to accommodate for existing loss factors, whether it is in cables or in the DC AC conversion, etc. And also for potential future loss of performance due to a lack of proper maintenance. It also allows to maintain a good number of pumping hours even during winter time, something very important because we did not consider to install batteries due to price and maintenance requirements. The cost for supplying the installation of the installed system was about 150,000 US dollars. Next slide, please. So to wrap up and conclude, I would like to present you some challenges that we faced throughout the project, but then finally also highlight the results. Um, the challenges we faced are similar to the ones faced by any construction project. However, in a humanitarian setting, things can be a bit more complicated. So there was a limited choice of location, the geography, and we wanted what was limiting us and then we wanted to be near to the pumping stations and it left us not much choice but to build nearby a quarry depending on the wind direction significant amounts of dust can accumulate on the panels and affect their performance there is also an increased residual risk of falling stones and furthermore hard rock formations discovered during construction works made it necessary to work around and adapt the location and arrangement of these panels repeatedly we faced land ownership issues. 
Despite being registered as public land, private entities made several claims throughout the project implementation. Handling the resulting delicate situations required a lot of attention and energy to, to be able to find positive resolutions of the conflicts. The location had to be slightly adapted last minute with the implementing contractor already working on the site. Organizational environment. So the organizational environment is fragile and this posed a big challenge. Although we clearly identified Becca Water Establishment as the legal owner of the project, uh, BWE Becca Water Establishment, however, uh, does did not yet have the capacity to take over the responsibility to operate and maintain the facility, both the water system and the solar system. So it is for that reason that we identified the Arsal Water Committee as the entity currently in the best position to do so. While the integration of the water committee into the water establishment is foreseen in the near future, financial limitations do currently not allow to do so fast enough, and this leaves the project somewhat suspended in space, making it very difficult to identify the best way forward that would allow safe and sustainable operation of the facility. Then we faced issues regarding technical knowledge and skills of the operators. It is limited, and on top of that, the water committee members do not receive regular and substantial salaries. So daily operation and maintenance, despite tailored capacity building, remains deficient and several issues were encountered after project completion. The solar panels are not being cleaned often enough, and in one particular case, faulty maintenance work done on the electrical system even damaged the pump again only shortly after, shortly after it was commissioned. Integration with other systemic support activities is very important, but a challenge, namely when it comes to capacity building activities. While we did basic capacity building, it however focused mainly on the basic operational aspects of the new infrastructure, and it did not sufficiently take into consideration other aspects such as maintenance works and management, which should be taken on by the Becca water establishment, but as we say, it's a little delayed. The aim is to integrate the water committee in the framework of Becca water establishment to, in the long term, really secure this support. We plan to establish a cost recovery scheme to support this process, and until then, the water committee will continue to be the authority operating these systems. On the results that we achieved, <clears throat> we managed to increase the water production by 35.7% which is an increase of 405 cubic meters per day that serves an additional 3,375 individuals. We have reduced the operational cost. Solar power is significantly cheaper than electricity from the grid or backup generators. We introduced redundancy. So in case the medium voltage power line is down, the solar system offers redundancy and allows water production for a minimum of 12 hours per day. And the solar system also helps to reduce the load on the only power line feeding our cell, making the grid more stable. Final slide, please. And I, it remains that I thank you for your attention and interest, and I warmly invite you to ask uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. It was such a nice detailed presentation and I'm pretty sure our attendees will appreciate all the technical details and program challenges that you shared. And we have a lot of questions popping in. So um, now Lisa is going to mute you for the while and um, let's begin with the Q&A session. So um, for the Q&A session, thank you to all the attendees for sending in your questions. And now we, like, we would like to start with Olivia. So Olivia, now Lisa is going to unmute you and we have some questions for you. So the first question that's, uh, that came was um, about the containers that you talked about that Schneider Electric deployed for you in Atsia. How does the operation and maintenance work when these containers are deployed in humanitarian settings? Okay, that's a very good question because uh... Uh, normally, when you operate a diesel generator, you have a lot of maintenance to, to do because of, there are a lot of uh, moving parts, spinning parts. 
so you have to change oil or change filters, change parts that are get, getting eroded. In a mi solar microgrid, there's no moving parts. It's all electronics. This is why uh, it requires normally no maintenance, despite, uh, like in the previous example, uh, cleaning the panels uh, every, every other day to make sure there's not too much dust on it and that it can produce enough energy. Uh, in order to ensure that it's maintenance free, uh, provided that on the site you can have a GSM signal, 2G and above, 3G, 4G, uh, we can also, thanks to our EcoStructure software platform, we can have access to real time data. And from remote, you can uh, monitor uh, the operation and as well as pilot and uh, control your microgrid. Even if there are, for example, uh, software uh, updates to, to do on the equipment, it can do, be done from remote. So basically, our containerized microgrid was designed specifically to have no maintenance. Uh, so, so, so really, this is the, the idea. Uh, we provide five years warranty for this, and the payback period is normally less than that. So if you replace a genset by this one, you will save uh, money uh, without any risk. Um, what re is required, though, is uh, competencies for installation and commissioning, which takes about half a day, uh, typically. It could be less for experienced people. And for this one, we can train your local people. Uh, it's actually quite easy to, to implement. It's, as it is plug and play and fully tested in factory, it really uh, works uh, like on and off button. Super, thank you so much. And just a follow-up question to that. Does the system, can this system also use for powering agriculture activities like milling, oil pressing, um, in, a, in and out of uh, displacement settings, such containers? Can we use them for these kind of productive activities? Yes, and that is exactly the, the purpose of this microgrid system. If you stick to regular solar lanterns, solar home systems, this will enable families to have access to electricity in the form of uh, points of light, uh, ventilation, uh, radio, sometimes TV, but not productive use. With microgrids, like the one I presented in the container, yes, you can feed pumps, you can feed motors, and by the way, the first uh, order we did take for West Africa, uh, UEMOA, we supplied 16 such containers for productive use in, uh, in rural villages where the main activity was agriculture. I can, can give you an example of a village in Senegal where the main activity is fish farming. So what they're using is the, the power is used partly for feeding the pumps that enable to circulate the water around the different ponds where they raise uh, fishes. And what's interesting is that since that time, they were able to increase their production and they are now becoming a, a seller of fish eggs, which is a new activity they launched thanks to this system. So really it creates opportunity for feeding machines. Uh, try to get one layer uh, more in the supply chain, meaning instead of providing raw products, they can start to process products such like crushing, uh, meals, etc. Uh, so increasing the revenue and of course the economy of the village. Super, thank you. Um, now we'll have we'll look, proceed to Martin and Geraldine. So um, Lisa will now unmute both of you. Um, and then the question to both Martin and Geraldine is for the systems that we talk about, um, there is no uh, stories in the solar pumping solution. So does that mean the systems are only working during solar hours? That's the first question. So we can start with that one. Well, I guess the I basic answer is no, but, but basically, please, Geraldine, that's your field. <laughs> yeah, I would say that uh, within Greenforce, of course, we uh, we are normally promote our, our end user to try to store the energy as water. So, because you could all, you could of course store the um, the power as uh, as uh, in in a battery in uh, as electricity, but you could also just uh, 
continue your, your pumping process or your water process as much as you can when the sun is shining the most and then store them as water. So, so you can actually store them in a water tank or you can just um, have a more efficient or faster uh, uh, water purification process so you have purified water. So the so majority of the energy should be used here and now to reduce the amounts of battery that you will probably need it. That is basically trying to take care of the capex that you will have a lower cost. But but I would say nevertheless that is just to some extent a, a small battery um, uh, availability is of course uh, is also rice that you can store some of them as a as a electricity as a backup. So we so basically it's not a no. I would say that uh, there are battery. We have partners like us standing here, and then there are battery options out there uh, that you can use. And for us, we are trying to encourage a solution that you can store them as water as much as you can, because water is also actually an energy form that you can store them. Definitely. Um, then I have uh, two more questions. So the first question is, are the pumps also hy hybrid systems? Or do you also have solar and generator operated hybrid pumps in your portfolio? That's the one question that came up. Um, when you say hybrid pump, then I would think that is uh, talking about mixing AC and DC. Yes. Uh, like, uh, no, yeah. um, I think the question was um, solar generated as well as diesel power, so making mix. That's I hope that's what he meant in his question. <laughs> So, so using the pump as a as a generator, generating power. So it's sort of reverse using it. Is that what you're saying? So I don't think so. I think it's it's multiple no. sources of power. Multiple right? sources. Yeah, yeah, that's what uh, I meant. Yeah. As Thank a you. as the basis on the product itself, it will be it will be any given time that it will be single source. And mm -hmm. so you but you can switch between AC and DC. So basically, you can switch between solar and generator as frequent okay. as you you preferred. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, if you are looking into uh, mixing the power, then it will need to have an external controller where we also have a solution that we can uh, we can support that. That will be a that will be a an extra component that we can also support you in order to mixing the power. So you can mixing the the solar panel power uh, with an extra power that is uh, missing. So if you have only eighty percent from solar, you can top up the last twenty percent from generator or from grid, uh, and then use an, an external uh, box to uh, combine them. And uh, and the reason that it has to be an external box is just to make sure that it can be adjusted to um, to first local regulations and also it can have an extra protections uh, due to fluctuations of unstable power. Thank you. That uh, makes also the system highly sustainable. Um, mm. Now I would like to move to Christian um, because we also have some questions popping in for Christian. So um, Geraldine uh, and Morten will now mute you and Christian will now unmute you. So for Christian, the question is, at what scale does the solar pumping system make sense, either in millimeter per hour or number of people? So the background for this question is, in APAC Uganda, existing solution is boreholes with hand pump. Oh, I think it's um, a very detailed question, but um, just to make it short, it would be, at what scale does the solar pumping system usually make sense? Uh, when you are planning a pump, what do you look at? Um, do you look at the number of people or um, how much water can you pump? So millimeter per hour or something like that. Okay, thank you very much for this question. I think uh, generally speaking, there are different uh, sizes of solutions. Of course, the smaller it is, let's say the easier it is to handle because it's easier to have a small system, let's say out of a box. Whereas the bigger it gets, the more uh, you need to know uh, what you do and how to maintain it as well. So for me, the question is, of course, in the beginning, you need to understand mostly how much water would you like to produce? And is the aquifer able to deliver that amount of water that you want to abstract? And then once this is known, you can design your pump, your solar system, etc. I hope I answered the question. No, definitely. Um, now I'll move on to next question, which is actually very interesting. So as an engineer, what do you think are the most ch um, are the challenges that engineer uh, as an engineering project face in a humanitarian setting as compared to designing projects in conventional engineering settings? Uh, also, this is an interesting question. I think in humanitarian settings, 
uh, it's the environment is more complicated it's often not as stable as an office where you do development or and research or where you try to develop a, an application so very often in humanitarian settings we find that uh, not only the infrastructure has a problem but there is also a lack of financial resources or there is a lack of uh, human resources maybe some engineers they left the country in the conflict in a conflict setting or or uh, they are not paid salaries so so they leave their jobs and and this is i think what complicates the work because a solution can only work if it addresses the hardware issue the infrastructure but then also taking into consideration all the other aspects and uh, for me as an engineer when i started in this field that was really a bit challenging to to change my mindset and also start understanding more these aspects definitely uh, thank you so much for that um, shedding light on that uh, on your experiences um, i have one more question for you so in your presentation, you talked about also um, planning the solar panels in such a way to avoid shading. So related to that, the question is, does the location away from mountains or planning in highlands to get maximum sunlight without the effect of shadow from these elements is better? So I guess the question is, um, could uh, you yeah. try to plan in highlands or mountains to get maximum sunlight in your case? yeah i think it depends on on the latitude and that you actually have you now on the planet because you have to tune the inclination angle of the panel to face optimally towards the sun throughout the day and sometimes it can be better if you do it in a flat land but then it can also be better the higher you're in the north the more you want to have inclination and there it's an advantage if you are already on an inclined surface Definitely. So yeah, that's a good answer. It depends on the uh, on the project, the location, and so on. So now I would then go back to Olivia uh, because we have also some question popping in for you. And Olivia, the question for you is: Do you provide assistance on hydro technology in off-grid systems? So the user says that there are a lot of problems with spare procurement. So how do you also deal with that? Yeah, sorry. You mean the uh, you mean uh, spare parts? Is that the yes. question? Yes, the question is. Um, um, so uh, normally, when we plan this kind of project, especially in rural settings, the spare parts, uh, the lack of or not not having easy access to spare parts is a problem. So, how do you, as a company, look look at this? Oh, this is exactly why we, we we believe in the containerized solution because the container is really standalone. As it is tested before shipment, uh, we are sure it works. So normally, at least for the first period of time after installation and commissioning, there is no need for uh, any spare parts. In case later on, because we have a warranty of five years, uh, the, the life cycle time is 20 years without need for change, changing the batteries. It's important to notice. Uh, if you reach maybe uh, 12, 15, uh, 18 years, yes, you will start to need spare parts. Normally, what we do is, thanks to our uh, monitoring system, we, we are capable of uh, assessing uh, when some parts need to be replaced. And in that case, we can anticipate. Uh, the, the beauty of this is that we, you don't need to wait for a component to fail before you change it. You can anticipate it. Uh, basically, we have a supply chain in uh, pretty much all the countries in Africa and Asia. So normally, there are spare parts which are available, uh, at least in capital cities. Then you need the time to ship them to the countryside, which can take uh, two, three, four days. Uh, but normally, this was designed specifically to avoid this issue. Um, Olivia, I think I lost you. Ah, uh, so did you hear anything of my response? No, no, I, I just missed the last sentence of yours, but I heard everything. Okay, okay, very good. Yeah, so I was saying that the 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 solution we designed was specifically made so as to avoid the issue of spare parts, really. That's a very good question. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, then I have one last question for you is, have you explored new technology like blockchain when uh, for the solar home systems? Uh, we are, uh, that's a good question. Also, we are looking into it right now. Uh, the concept of blockchain is very, very uh, interesting. The limitation we're having in terms of applying this concept to electrical networks is that, uh, you know, when you exchange uh, between two uh, computers or several computers, uh, you have no issue on the, the capacity to, to, to transport the messages from one computer to another one. When you talk electricity, actually, if you want to be able to share diff with different users in SHS, you will need to size the cables uh, and, and, and for that purpose, it will render uh, the in initial investment uh, really, really high and too high to be bankable. So we're looking at uh, other ways, uh, also partnering with some startups who are looking into this, uh, companies like Okra, for instance. But yes, we are looking into it and trying to solve this problem of the sizing of the cables to interconnect the different SHS. Super. Thank you so much. Um, and now I would like to go back to Christian um, because there is also a very nice interesting question pop popping in. The question is, in emergency responses, especially in natural disaster, most nation grid will fully recovered in around two weeks or months. So how do you anticipate when most of the community, um, so what do you anticipate? Will the most of the community use a national grid rather than the DRE solutions, or is the is it other way around? I think the important part is again to understand the local context because it can vary a lot. And uh, what we often find in our work is that uh, yes, there is a public system, and then also this public system is not able anymore to provide uh, the services as it's intended to. And then the, the tricky part is, is really to identify how best to support the system to uh, put it back in service as much as possible. And sometimes it can absolutely also make sense to focus on one specific standalone solution. Whereas in other cases, it's better to work more on, a, on an upstream level, on a globe, more global scale. Thank you. I think then the takeaway for today is it highly depends on the situation, the context we are talking, and it's not possible to generalize any kind of solutions. Would that mm -hmm. be? That is really, it's, it's the important thing that, in my opinion, we have to think really about a system and not only a technical solution and the system will kind of guide you towards the best technical solution. Definitely. Thank you so much. And now I'll come back to Morten and Geraldine. So I'll quickly unmute both of you. So the question um, to Mo both Morten and Geraldine is, so do you also provide training and operation and maintenance to local client, possibly already engaged in some kind of repair works? Morten? Yeah, um, well, I can also answer that. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we uh, we do a lot of training directly from Gunfors, and uh, we also have a lot of our service partner where we do a lot of local training. So we do training. Um, normally, we do a few different level of training. We uh, we train our NGO partner. Um, so there will be a lot of uh, country manager or their their technical designer will be trained when we are designing the project, and then uh, while we are commissioning them, we also will do local training, and um, and most of the time we would already have a, a local service partner that is um, that is able to handle the system, and but otherwise then we will start uh, already on the designing phase and start to pen those training where we will train the local service provider. And then, as well as the also uh, also to the end user on her, on the operation level, of course, yeah. But uh, but we offer a lot of trainings, and also both to uh, to the locations where if they have technical school and also university, when uh, if we see that there will be uh, a lot of development project coming in the area, then we will also uh, join force with those university and start to uh, give a lot of trainings to the to the student there. 
Thank you so much. Um, and that was really um, uh, a huge thank you to all those um, speakers for the amazing question and answer session. So as we can see, we are coming towards the end of the webinar. So we have five more minutes. So maybe we can take, sorry, I miscalculated. So we have five more minutes. So we can maybe take a few more questions. And um, I would maybe start with Geraldine yourself itself. Since you said you provide training, there was also one follow-up question. It's about the solar kiosks that you explained in your presentation. So are these solar kiosks also managed by the community and the and they prov you provide the technology or technology or is it um, you man you manage as well as provide the technology in terms of the solar kiosk? And majority of them, I would say they are actually. Uh, managed by the, the local community or a uh, local small-scale uh, water utility. So this is not the same as the utility where we see in Europe, but it's a very local uh, water utility that um, that they will be handling. And in some of the cases, actually owned by the community. And m in many cases, you can say it also different from uh, how the project is started, because it's also the, uh, the partner that we have worked with, and normally we work with the uh, the, the NGO and also the local governments and then we can decide what is the best solution for this community to um, to deploy this uh, kiosk to be owned by whom and but I would say the the local community involvement are normally very very high because they need operator uh, monitor and also sometimes also mandate and then they also need maintenance uh, we offer the platforms um, to make sure that the transactions where where the payments and also uh, and also the monitoring is very transparent and then we offer the, that digital platforms to make sure that everyone in the process so, so from the donor to the to the end user can see all the transactions thank you that was um, really helpful and i'm um, i'm confident that involving the local community also makes a huge difference in the success and failure of any projects yeah. so now i would actually move to christian and um, there are a few questions coming up for you, Christian, so I will now unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself since I see you have muted yourself. Yeah. So the question, question to you, Christian, is again about the technical details, um, the boreholes that you talked about, what was the depth of these boreholes? And the second follow-up question is, um, at what depth um, these solar pumps can work efficiently? Uh, yeah, so the boreholes in our cell are around 400 meters deep and uh, 300, yeah, 380 to 400 meters deep and, and there are different uh, pumps available for different depths. Now, the, the less the depth, the smaller the solar system because the deeper you go, the higher up you have to lift the water and the more uh, power is required to do this work. But I think there is a very wide range of pumps available, and maybe, um, yeah, maybe um, Grundfos could answer this question better than me. Sure. Then I'll just ask you a follow-up question, and I'll ask uh, before that. Um, I'll just ask Geraldine if you want to comment something on that. Yeah, I would say um, it is very difficult to say uh, very specific uh, how deep the borehole is, but I would say uh, in, in countries like Lebanon and in many of the Middle East countries and in Africa, we start to see that that, that actually the borehole is getting quite deep right now uh, because of the lower um, uh, water aggregate. So in some of the cases, we see that the water level is going down to 200 and 300 meters uh, that much. and uh, and But there are also um, in many cases, that's also because uh, the project has tend to like to provide a lot of water in one installation. And uh, so in many cases, we also start to promote uh, that, uh, that uh, the project plan to have a smaller installation, but more installation in different locations. So there are fewer advantages. And that's first of all, then the installation doesn't have to be too large. 
like Christian also mentioned, that the, the size of the solar panel is also a challenge. And, and second is, then you don't have to draw too much water into one borehole, and, uh, and people actually can have excess of water. And the drawback of that is, of course, when you have multiple boreholes and multiple installations, and the capacities uh, tend to become higher because you need to have more installation in, in a time. But I would say in the long run, uh, both on sustainable water source and also to the to the end user, it is actually uh, a little bit better. I don't know if that answers your questions. Thank you to both of you. Um, that was, um, yeah, as you mentioned. Um, so now, as I can see on my screen, we are coming towards the end of the webinar and it was a lovely webinar with all the amazing discussions coming up. And I know you have been sending us a lot of questions and we have not been able to answer all of them. So what we are going to try is we are going to try to send it to all the presenters so that we can at least get responses on the ones that we have not managed to touch upon today. So I would like to thank you one more time for such amazing discussions for to all our presenters for the amazing presentations and have a good day and thank you one more time. And before I close the webinar on your screen, you can see a feedback email. So you can always send us feedback on this email address if you have any question, comments, suggestions about the webinar and you can also see the webinar documentation link on this link we'll upload all the presentations and the recording of this webinar and we will also send you a reminder email so that you can have access to this link and as i mentioned this webinar is a series of webinars so stay tuned for our upcoming webinars uh, next month or the month after and finally as you close the webinar a survey will pop, uh, pop up so please take the time to fill the survey and give us your feedback as all your feedback will help us to streamline our upcoming webinars. So saying that, I'd like to close the webinar for today. And once again, thank you to everyone and have a good day.